able to trust God and allow our children to make mistakes. Why is it that we can't allow our children to fail? God allows us to fail all the time. Psalm 103 says this of, that the Lord God does not deal with us according to our sins. As a father has compassion upon his children, so the Lord has compassion upon us. Um, every day, every day needs to be a new day of compassion. How many know the verse that says that his mercy is new and fresh every morning? How many have heard that verse in the Bible? How many know that that's not in the Bible? Okay. Isn't that something? It's like, yeah, it is. You know, I read it this morning. No, you didn't. It's not in the Bible. Let me quote it verbatim. Unless you got an NIV. NIV kind of distorts things, but this is what it says. It says, because of his mercies, we're not consumed. His compassion is new every morning. Okay? That's a big difference. The difference is this. Number one, mercy in the morning means that if you're breathing when you wake up, you receive God's mercy during the night. And then God gives you new compassions every morning. The word compassion in Hebrew is the word for a mother's womb. Safe, secure, full of nourishment, protected. God says that every single morning when we wake up, his compassions are new. He does not hold yesterday to the next day. And so often, we just want to make our children get it. And we just kind of, we're in their face doing that. God does not deal, if we, see, God is the model as a father. How does God father us? How does he parent us? He's merciful. He's compassionate. In fact, the Bible says in the Old Testament that God's mercy extends to how many generations? A thousand. And his judgment extends to how many generations? Three and four. So God's very imbalanced, isn't he, with his judgment and his mercy? A thousand to four. God says he wants us to be the same with our children. Does that mean that you don't discipline? Absolutely not. When the Lord loves, he disciplines. You know? But your mercy needs to be far greater throughout the day. If our children see us as imbalanced as God is, guess what will happen? They will be drawn to us. I have ne and they will be willing to admit their faults. I have never once in 30 years ever been afraid to confess my sins to my Heavenly Father. Not once. Why is that? Because he says he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Those who desire to be perfect parents really desire perfect children so their own image will be exalted. The first process adopted by Fenelon toward his young pupil was the influence of his own character. He succeeded in persuading because he succeeded in making himself love. Jonathan, when he was 15 years old, looked me in the eye and said, Dad, when your life lives louder than your words, I'll follow you. And that was after God had already broken me. So I knew at that point, this was not a time to say, What'd you say? <laughs> Get over here. You don't talk to me that way. I'll ground you for the rest of your life. You know? No, God had, God had already started teaching me. That when other people say things that poke me, that's the time that I say nothing. And I think about it. And I say to God, God, I know what he just said was wrong, disrespectful, dishonoring, and deserving of all your judgment. <laughs> but there may be something that I can't see right now. And so before you judge him, help me to see what I'm supposed to see. And you want to know what happens? Every single, every single solitary time, God reveals to me what was hidden in my own life. And I have to then go over to him and tell him I'm sorry. I hate the process. <laughs> but it's amazing what God has been doing in my life. He does it even with my staff. I mean, that young man standing over there with the curly hair, and he's, the, he's gonna kill me. I tell him to do something, and he's got another way to do it all the time. But you know what? God has brought him into my life to help humble me so that I could be the servant so that he'll learn to follow. And he's been a great young man to me. So God has really blessed me with him. His name is Walter. So the question is, do you want to control your children or do you want to influence them? Do I want to make Walter do what I want him to do or do I want to influence him so that he'll see, yeah, I want to be on board. He does. Hope you don't mind me using this illustration. <laughs> Jonathan's not here, so you're the next best thing. 
When we put responsibility above relationship, it always leads to frustration. And so often, that's the problem. We are on our own agendas. And some of you, probably many of you that are, you know, obsessive, compulsive, perfectionistic, like I am, you want the house clean, you want things done in a certain way, and you want it done now. And what happens is, is we use our children as our idols to be able to fulfill the things that we think are important in life. And that's just talking about the idols of our own heart. We get stressed out and frustrated and demanding for them to do what they're supposed to do because we want to be glorified and we've taken the seat of God. And whenever there are idols in your heart, you want to know what happens? You always, always go to extreme measures to get your point across. In the days of Elijah, they were slashing themselves on their back. They were always committing atrocities. They were yelling and screaming and, and, and hurting themselves in order to get their point across. Same thing happens in parenting. The authoritative parent whose eye is ever upon their child, always scolding, thinking they're fulfilling their educative role, departing nothing. They're going to oppress their children, especially parents who place the weight of the family concerns upon them. Um, this only torments and discourages. Remember the statement, children need to be fully loved, fully known, without any fear of rejection. That's why we go to God. And no matter what we've done, we're able to go to God and ask for forgiveness. If our children, though, are afraid of us, and the consequences, that's what they're going to do. They're going to le learn to be good liars and deceitful. And they're going to hide their sin in ways in which you'll never be able to see because the consequence of of them admitting what they've done to you is greater than that forgiveness can possibly be in restoration. Um, I, I love this, um, this one illustration. It was a, um, a mom who couldn't get her daughter to put her bike away. She was only six years old. And I'll never forget, she was, uh, it was at a conference like this, much larger conference, and the um, friend of, of this woman came to my booth and said, my my friend has this daughter who's six, and this daughter is having temper tantrums, and the mother just can't deal with it anymore. In fact, she's just ready to lose it. And she's just a new homeschool mom. And she said, do you think you can help? And I said, well, I, I don't know. I said, but I would be glad to just listen and, and see what's going on. So she brought her friend over there, and, and uh, she said to me, uh, I introduced myself and explained to me that um, her daughter's having these temper tantrums. And I said, well, when does she have the most violent temper tantrums? What, what happens? And she said, well, before and after a spanking, she always acts this way. I said, okay. Can you give me an illustration of when, when she might get spanked? She said, when she doesn't put her bike away. And I looked at her and I said, you spank your daughter because she doesn't put her bike away? She said, do you have a problem with that? I said, yeah. I said, why would you spank her for not putting She said, because it's not being responsible and my husband could run over it or someone can fall over and get hurt and I'm trying to teach her to be responsible. You have a problem with that? <laughs> no, but I think I see the problem here. <laughs> and she, uh, she was getting a little irritated and I'm thinking like, this is not going anywhere. So you know, the best way to deal with situations like that is head on. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go for it. I said, I see the problem. She said, what? I said, you're a provocative parent. She said, what? I said, you're provoking your children to anger. She said, I'm not going to sit here and listen to this blank blank. And off she went. You know, the friend is looking at me like, what do I do? I said, I don't know. Go get her and drive her back. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you wouldn't believe it. Here it was in the, in, the, in the exhibit hall. And you've got this woman holding on to this arm of another woman, literally dragging her. This woman is now crying hysterically, coming back to our booth. And I'm looking at her and I said, I can help you. And she's, she's going, I don't know what to do. You know, she's screaming, crying. And I said, it's simple. I said, the next time your daughter comes into the house, usually you probably say, did you put your bike away? You know, And you've got to go and say, go put that bike away. And the daughter goes out, and she comes back in, and you say, did you put the bike away? And she says, yes.